Welcome to Today You Are Perfect trainer Collins Kelly, a monthly reading series sponsored by Iowa City Poetry. I'm Lisa Roberts, director of Iowa City Poetry, and this month in honor of National Poetry Month, we're delighted to co-host this hybrid event with the Iowa City Public Library. Thank you so much, ICPL, for inviting us. This is wonderful. We're usually, we're usually online. So <laughs> it's fun for us to see real people. Um, the reading tonight is our ninth event for Poetry Month, and we'll wrap up April in style this Saturday the 30th, 5 to 8 p.m., with Iowa City Poetry Al Fresco. Can you join us? It's a progressive outdoor poetry party, a reading with over 35 poets presenting their own work at 12 different sites in the College Hill neighborhood. Uh, you can read the full lineup and the schedule at iowacitypoetry.com, and we hope you'll join us. So now I want to turn the mic over to our host for the evening, curator of Today You Are Perfect since she founded it in the summer of 2020, and the always inventive poet who's the author of 14 chapbooks, four full-length poetry collections, three nonfiction books, all of them including my personal favorite, the female citizens of Sunshine Nation face off against light-sucking demons, <laughs> Jenny McBain Stevens. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was such a lovely introduction. I'm so happy to be here with all of you sharing this space in person, live, at the Iowa City Public Library for April's Poetry Month. This is just really exciting, and there's just great energy in this room. So I'm just really, really excited to hear the poets and the writers tonight. So, and thank you. Thank you to Iowa City Public Library and Beth Fisher and Bond, who is also helping us with techni technical things tonight. Thank you to them for all of their hard work. So I always like to Google the poets. <laughs> um, in addition to the bios that they send me, I also like to Google them and read their poems online and just, and just see what I come up with. And so for our first reader tonight, Genevieve Trainer, I would like to say she really is a human of all trades. <laughs> she is not only the publisher of Little Village, which now I hear is expanding to Des Moines, congrats, <laughs> that's really exciting, but also an amazing journalist, the editor of an anthology inspired by Dante's Inferno, also involved in the Afrofuturist Center and featured in the Midwest Writing Center's Write More Light, which I did catch some of that. And it's one of the reasons why we asked you to be on Today You Are Perfect, because you have such a wonderful energy. And we love hearing you speak about anything. Like I'd hear you, I would listen to you read the phone book. So, <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to now read the formal bio <laughs> for Genevieve. Okay. Genevieve Trainer, publisher and arts editor at Little Village Magazine, is an editor, critic, and creator based in Iowa City, Iowa. Passions include comic books, stoner rock, tabletop gaming, and arguing about politics. Everything good about them is attributable, attributable to wife Madeline and offspring Calliope, DC, and Talia. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be here. I'll echo what everyone said about seeing real faces. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Um, I dropped off of writing poetry for a long time until the pandemic, and all of the readings that I've done probably since my older kids were in middle school, have been online. <laughs> so, welcome back to me. <laughs> How to emerge. Drink water. No, more than that. Read and answer difficult emails. Admit that this you can't continue. Remember the parts of you that worked. Say goodbye to all that's cracked and shriveled Slither free. 
unplugged. My laptop only works anymore when it's plugged in, only holds a charge for a few minutes tops, can only, can, can't rely on its own power, can't survive unsupported. It drains resources, it tries so fucking hard, but always takes more than it gives. It dreams of only recharging when necessary, but that's always now. Feral. Wild thing, I know I love you. You push my buttons and strain my grace. I am too old to fight back, so I soak in you. I steep in the white hot water of your rage and pray that I am chamomile. Society has washed its hands of us, has taken our passions and our wisdom and said, so what? So why should we maintain its thin propriety? For whose sake are we anything but wild? Howling at the night, you pace your cage and long for quiet. It's not a jungle out there, it's a zoo. And all the zookeepers have left and I am too old to fight, but I am desperately trying to learn how to break a lock. Uh, this next one was written uh, in March of this year uh, for International Women's Day. Uh, hashtag IWD. When I wake up and she's not in bed beside me, I fear the worst. Every time. Despite a decade and a half of dealing with her insomnia, existing is exhausting when the world insists you don't. I mistake and misattribute every sound, hoping for footsteps, rage even, some indication that today is not a day for giving in, up, Every time she's late coming home, every time she walks to the store, every moment I'm not by her side, I fear a litany of worsts. The world is ravenous for grief. Happy International Women's Day to all women, except J.K. Rowling and Kim Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> Everything falls apart. Wood rots and splinters, clothes and minds unravel. Will withers like flowers. Time is a worm two days after the rain. Show me a warm breeze that isn't complicit in erosion. All sunshine shrivels. Every soft rain fades. Whether we touch this world kid-gloved or ham-fisted, we are still agents of chaos change, and decay. Just observing a particle affects its behavior. You cannot live unlisted. This next uh, set um, was inspired by thinking back on some of the pithy sayings that my grandmother always had that, in retrospect, were very antithetical to hope. Uh, <laughs> she, she favored the, the turns of phrase that sort of, you know, they encourage caution, but they, they aren't good at raising someone who looks forward with pleasure to the future. And I'm trying to work against that. Uh, the group of them is called You'll Catch Your Death. <laughs> Aphorism one. When I was little, I always wanted to know, how will you know how much food to have for the chickens if you wait until they're hatched to count them? They called me contrary. But if you don't prepare for success, it'll peck you to death with tiny but effective attacks. And once it's bled you dry, you'll find you have no chickens at all. Aphorism two. What exactly is a bird worth? The price you get for selling it? The meal its flesh provides? The pillow its feathers fill? Or is sport the sole consideration here? Success me measured in tally marks? For my money, I'll take the two in the bush. I'll rest here. I'll watch them flirt and sing. I'd always rather watch than kill. 
and they look ha much happier anyway. That happiness, that life, that freedom, I don't need to hold it to know that it's worth more. Aphorism three, I'm sorry that I never bought that comic shop. Philosophically, on good days, I believe regret is a fool's enterprise. Any choice I'd have made differently would rob me of my present, except that lone, lingering, what if? Sometimes I ruminate too long. I'm 20 again, and in my element, full of bravado and, well, actuallys, a hero to the middle schoolers who supply my weed. <laughs> I could own this world as well as run it, but I yearn with all my heart to do the right thing. It wasn't until later that I realized you are never, ever, ever better safe. Aphorism four. All the world's a stage and all entrapping trappings merely costumes. We are not beholden to our seamstress. Someday these pants may hang loose on our frame beyond belting, or we may outgrow these others' seams bursting. The role in which we're cast is not our cast. It's only holding us until we're healed enough to break free. Make no mistake. We can change our spots a dozen times before we're done. We can even choose what lines we roar. Aphorism five. Sirens blared, the rain cascaded down, and somehow these twin reasons to seek shelter canceled each other out. I strode down the street, leer-like, arms outstretched, like, come at me, bro, blow, you hurricanos. Deep in my memory, my grandmother's admonitions warred against the glow of invincibility, the look in strangers' eyes, incredulous, uncertain, if I was mad or undeterrable, this is my favorite self. Had I blown away, I'd simply call it flying. No, I wasn't about to catch my death of cold. I was too busy catching life. Someday, I'll die. And all that I'll leave behind will be 175 unopened emails. <laughs> Unless they download my brain, in which case there will also be 175 untested theories, 175 unwritten stories, 175 unmanifested goals, and an infinite loop of the Doctor Who theme song. <laughs> With such a rich interior life, why would I ever be in the world? <laughs> my impulses and inventory, caution, criticism, reckless abandon, reckless abandonment. Complex terror, twisted excitement, anxiety, inadequacy, untenable reality begin again anew, renew, revise, revisit. All the preparation and hard work, and I still don't feel I deserve this. Shouldn't there be confidence? I don't know how hard to push. I'm not a people person. This work is so opaque. I am frightened and obscured. Blinded. Free rights are bullshit. They want to be poems but turn tangential. I want to be a poem. I want to control my meter, define my rhyme. I want to telegraph my turns and know when each gulf will appear. Poetry is language making sense. I want to make sense, but I am just a tangent. <laughs> Look. I use the word look in my poetry frequently because it's crucial to me that you know my thoughts are sacrosanct. They might morph or grow or even 180 realign, maybe by the end of the poem, but in this moment, I am weaving for you here an object out of air, an object to be objectified, to be held and dropped and broken and mulled over. Look, I have made it to be seen, the tangibility of paper, Vibrations of voice calling into being. Look, my thoughts are air. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> oh, I was so caught up, I forgot to take my mask off. 
Thank you, Genevieve. That was so such a joy. <laughs> it's just a joy to hear you read your work. And I hope that maybe we can see some of this in the world, like, you know, <laughs> in the future. Like, <laughs> send it out. And <laughs> that'd be awesome. Like, I just, it's just, it's a joy to hear you. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, our next reader is Ryan Collins who has traveled here from Rock Island, Illinois. Thank you so much, Ryan, for making that trip. And I'm going to say, if you, it's, I would definitely suggest you look up some of Ryan's poetry on the internet. Um, he has this great poem in Ninth Letter where there's two columns of poetry that you can read down or across, <laughs> which is always like, a geeky fan, <laughs> just like a, a geeky fan excitement thing for me. And the title of that poem is called A Moment Frozen in Time Between Two Men Realizing That Maybe in Another Life They Were the Same Man. <laughs> so I just suggest you, um, I suggest you to look that up. And he also has these wonderful prose poems in Five to One, which is a, fa a, a favorite publication of mine. I just, I love the stuff that they do. So, yeah, so I encourage that. And I also wanted to mention that we will have a Q&A session at the end of this, at the end of Danica's reading. If anyone has a question, like, feel free to ask us. And we will have the poets sit up here you know, like it's a Marvel, you know, press <laughs> press release. <laughs> so, okay, and now I will introduce Ryan. Ryan Collins is the author of a book of poems, a new American field guide and songbook, and several chapbooks. His poems have appeared in another Chicago magazine, Asymptote, Columbia Poetry Review, Diagram, Forklift Ohio, Handsome, Ninth Letter, Pen Poetry Series, Verse Daily, and many other places. Recent prose poems have appeared in Apartment, Crazy Horse, The Pinch, Poor Claudia, Side Reel Magazine, and Zocalo Public Square. He is an English instructor at St. Ambrose University and the executive director of the Midwest Writing Center. He hosts the Spectra Reading Series in Rock Island, Illinois, where he lives. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Iowa City Library. <laughs> People working the ones and twos. Uh, it's amazing to be here. I used to, I lived in Iowa City for a long time. I always love coming here. Uh, it's such a gift to be reading with you, Genevieve, Danica. I'm so excited to, to be doing this and reading in front of people, like human actual people, um, is, uh, is pretty wonderful. Um, I always joke with my students that, like, you know, if they got a really nice cardboard cutout of themselves, like, I probably wouldn't know the difference when we're on Zoom and things like that. So I think maybe some of them have taken advantage. Um, yeah, um, let's read some poems. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the first poem I'm going to read, I'm just going to read a bunch of different stuff. Um, I don't have anything to like read from necessarily, I just have poems. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is a poem that I wrote for my mom, uh, whose birthday is uh, April 19th, so just a few days ago. Uh, I wrote this for her a couple of years ago on her birthday, um, and it's, it's like my one poem about flowers, so it's like my spring poem, uh, kind of about flowers. Uh, so it's called, uh, What Lilacs Say to Daffodils. What lilacs say to daffodils matters only to the mother who listens. Only a flower, some say, only a gift, but the darkness settles in and frost returns, leaving most of us nothing but taken by surprise. Most surprises are terrible, as uncertainty makes no gift of its cruel odors. So daffodils and lilacs keep their correspondence secret, unable to take themselves in for the night, where someone's mother keeps them warm and safe from the cold. Where we are, where anyone is born, means nothing if we have a mother's careful listening. Uh, 
Uh, I'm gonna, I was going to read some new stuff. I have like not written much uh, in a while, but I got a couple like little new ones. So I was going to like read some of those because uh, I've never read a man before, and it's I've never read in the Iowa City Library before. And so we're going to do that. Yeah, right. Um, so this one, uh, this is one of the new ones, and it's called Maturity. The children get to believe in merit and magic long enough to entertain their parents before they reveal the trick to growing up that there is no trick, before belief becomes dangerous to the persons the parents hope their children might become, forgetting how much imagination they gave up to become the adults they imagined their parents wanted, despite having never asked them. So now the parents cannot imagine what else their children might be. Thinking, thinking of my daughter, I, was, I just had dinner with my daughter, so uh, that one's for the kids. Um, what little writing I've done since the pandemic, I tried to like, I was like writing a series of poems and they were all just, they all just had the title disorientation, like early on and like the, the lockdowns, right? And like, um, and I was like in a writing group for a little while, so I had like a little bit of accountability and we shared prompts. Like if people know Kendra DiColo, really terrific poet, um, she kind of started this like Wednesday afternoon group and it was like, um, it, it, it was a blessing um, to just be able to sort of like step outside and have this prompt and write into that. And I kept trying to write those for a while. And so this is one of the last ones that I wrote. And I actually wrote it on my birthday in uh, 2020, which is kind of weird. Uh, and it borrows a line from a poem from Frank O'Hara. So this is Disorientation, November 20th, 2020, after a line by Frank O'Hara. Outside of shrapnel, our bodies will dissolve anything we put inside ourselves, given enough time. Not to say anything gets solved. We remain unsolved, remain variables in the unstable equations of our passing days. What grinds out of us and collects in halos around our feet gets swept up, out, away. The tendons and ligature begin to rot, questions beg. What will rock us to sleep becomes harder to come by, usually falling off in sudden, dreamless heaps. Hard to have grace and live as variously as possible when confined to the home, such as homes are, even on the year's last sunbright day. Unsolved and unspared, our bodies will dissolve and take with them everything we put inside ourselves, even love. Settling in to watch the last moat of daylight before winter, before unsettled days pass like sand through an hourglass, minute glass, each atomic second falling for what seems like an entire year, but is soon followed by another and another. Too many months of shortened days for us to account for our given time, for the time we've given and the what our time was given for. Given over to the uncertain timing of sunset or rise, we are left beggars to questions, searching for grace in the dust. Yeah, I, mean, I should have, I might bum everybody out. So if I do, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Um, this one's probably gonna keep it moving along the same line. So I wrote this. Um, uh, it's been a rough couple of years. Um, uh, I wrote this on Good Friday in 2021, so like about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine that served in the military um, who is not sort of down with a lot of the fascist stuff that we've been seeing out there, but is, is vaccine averse because apparently when you go to boot camp, you get like a battery of shots and you don't exactly know, or he didn't exactly know what they were. And so now he is sort of like, it's not even like vaccine averse, he's just sort of shot averse, like unless he needs it to stay like. And it was just kind of, a, it went from like, oh, I'm talking a while to this weird sort of conversation that ended uh, abruptly. And so I wrote this after I talked to him uh, and it mentions a friend of mine named John. Um, uh, that was my cat, uh, John Falstaff, uh, who, uh, who, who passed away during the pandemic. So yeah. Thank you, I do, I, I do too. Um, so this is speaking with an old friend on Good Friday. The phone rings and no conspiracy awaits on the other end other than grief and a hard sun pouring over our catching up 
but to where and with whom as yet unclear, trying to hear a reflection of myself in the voice of a friend, or at least once a friend, now who can be sure what that means and what space, screen to screen or voice and face to face, the tired of a whole year without friends embraces the room's cold light with a lump in a throat that hasn't cleared since so many passed, my best friend John who wasted and died in my arms and how not to be reminded of grief with every breath anymore each breath feels less clean like the handshakes and hugs once so freely given to people we've never clearly seen until at some remove how chilling the sunlight when singing around me like a bell a tongue clanging on and on with a single lonely note um uh, yeah bummer sorry um <laughs> This is a, a, a poem, uh, uh, this is just a litany, uh, and it's called Fugue State in, in D minor. To serve, not to strive, to starve, to contract, to carve passwords into the skin of ash trees, to lose time in the smoke of burning sweet potatoes, to be an overripe banana bruised by the air, to work under, not with, not in the company of, to flight risk, to fugue state, to thunder strike, to the break of day and the ache of night, to twilight between, to swerve, to sidewalk chalk, to be played, not to be an instrument, to be an instrument, to make hollow, to hallow, to sing holy, 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 to sacrifice, to figure eight the ice, to sleight of hand, to grandstand, to kneel and pray, to warble like a barn swallow, to connect and disconnect, to hornet's nest, to unrest, to have a contract out on your life, to uncork, to be served. Uh, this is another new one, uh, tiny little short new one, uh, and it's called Accomplishment. To mark the achievement of walking the circumference of a lake named after a robber baron, we slow, nut, we slow roast butternut squash and bandy about other possible names for lakes. To feel powerful and change nothing, the way a robber baron must feel after getting cleaned out by time or the market or his thieving nephew who, le who learned well how to move through the world from his uncle who claimed to own a lake but no one owns lakes or mountains any, any more than a clock owns time. Um, a few years back, I got invited to contribute to a project uh, where, where poets and writers were asked to write poems in response to um, people who had been killed by police. Um, and so this was uh, the poem that I wrote uh, for a gentleman named uh, Darius Graves. Uh, who was shot uh, by police in Rantoul, Illinois, on August 6, 2015. Um, this is called Workday. He was 31 years old. Um, Workday. We wake up some mornings and never fell asleep. We sleep for days sometimes without a dream. Summer sweats out all the salts. December makes us forget we need. We need so much and more always needed from us. Do more with less, more hours in a day. Too many days without dreaming and how to know if we're asleep. We have and have and have to give more than our hunger allows. We hunger only for restful sleep, only to dream and wake up without fearing what the day will ask. The day asks more than it needs, more than anyone we know can deliver. We try to sleep through lunch, but the hunger wakes us. We do what we can, and the day seems to care less how much of ourselves we give. Smoke them if you have them, the day says. Sleep when you're dead. We are awake and trying to take more out of our dreams to give our waking lives. None of it is enough. More and more, the day says, do more with less. So many nights and no sleep, no dreams to steal ourselves, hungry at work, 
never enough, the day always more hungry than we can allow ourselves to be. No matter how much we take from our dreams, the day waits outside the door, hungry to take away more than anyone can afford in one life, more than we can suffer to give. Um, so those prose poems that Jenny mentioned, I was just going to read a couple, two or three of those. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I was kind of like going through and figuring out what I was going to read, and I realized that I wrote this one in this library maybe like four or five years ago. Uh, I came up here to visit my daughter, as, I'm, as I enjoy doing, and, uh, and it, we, it was like one of those days where you kind of get like a surprise little snow squall, snowstorm sort of thing. So I got all the way up here, and it just sort of like started bombing out with snow, and our plans sort of got... Uh, I think we were going to go like Christmas shopping or something like that. I can't remember what we were going to do, but we didn't really end up doing it. We just got some food, and I bounced out very slowly back to the Quad Cities. So um, uh, this is uh, called The Half-Life of Sudden Blizzards. Winters went nuclear before our parents were born, before our grandfathers died from heart attacks shoveling snow, passing clouds bursting with ash, the surprise flurries, the trick melting, Snow angels stuffed to the mittens with fallout. The gas floored, the tread worn useless. The ground spiked with coolant leaked from the glowing green cylinders of our dreams where nothing goes wrong. Emergency sirens slushed. Ambulance lights spun out into drifts. All the sky blue salt in the world spread too late. I don't, I don't like winter much. I don't, I don't like winter at all. I, I grew up in the Midwest, and I, I hate it more and more as time goes by. Uh, I, get, I get the whole snowbird thing more and more as, as time goes by. Uh, and like all these prose poems, I guess I should say, um, these are sort of like a very loose reimagining of the movie, uh, The NeverEnding Story. Do people know that movie? It was a book, too, but like mostly the movie. Yeah, we know that one. Cool, yeah, I love that movie. Um, and it's sort of imagining like uh, the nothing is like the big heavy, but it is like formless, uh, shapeless. It has no voice. Um, it just has an avatar that is like a large wolf that speaks on its behalf, and it's just devouring the world due to a lack of human imagination, which strikes me as a very like... Um, quality metaphor for um, the climate catastrophe that we're all sort of experiencing um, and how like our lack of imagination maybe plays a role in that. Um, so this is one of the first ones of those I wrote, uh, and it's really short. Uh, it's called Song in the Key of a Cabin Glacier. It was a couple houses down, then give me three steps, baby, then four days, then five years, then the fight of the century, then the life of seven bulls, then 1,100 miles. A long way to drive and barely past liftoff. Still within earshot, taxiing the runways. First the radiator craps out, then the radio, then the climate control, then the climate. Uh, I got two more. I'm going to read a prose poem and a new one. Uh, and this last prose poem uh, I wrote for a friend of mine uh, named Ray Malone, who um, was a really fantastic musician. He passed away a few years ago. Um, and one of the bands that he was in, one of his musical projects was uh, Meth and Goats. They played a lot up here. Like if you were around here of a certain age, like my age, if you were in, like in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, if you were around here, you might know who Meth and Goats are. Uh, and this poem borrows a title of one of their songs uh, for its title, uh, and it's called How Do We Get to the Sun? We satellite and globally position and triangulate echoes. Bodies revolve around bodies, and we listen to what's obscured. We hear ourselves listen to the mirror arrays aim to soak the sun out of heaven and sustain the revolutions per minute carrying us door to door, out of windows, over the shoulders of mountain passes. Like salt through an hourglass, these are the sands through our fingers, each crashing into open water like calving glaciers. Time and distance collapse into the warm breath of the nothing, rising off the steaming ice, cloud shadows on the mountain we've emptied and fortified into our last fortress, where we outlast the sun. And this is my last one, and it's a new one. Thank you again for, for having me and 
making this happen. Um, yeah. Uh, this is called The Future. Even though today the sun breaks back across December to spare us a few bonus minutes of warmth at the end of this death on a pale horse of a year, it's a wonder we haven't gone to pieces, as so many of us secretly confess to no one how we're dissolving like bones eaten from the inside out by a cancer, by sporadic dread, by a vice of anxiety pressing all of us together and keeping us tightly apart, grasping at easy breaths like lightning bugs back when we were kids, back when it was warmer and there was more light. When we thought there would be more light and found ourselves wandering through debt and debris clouds, and wildfire smoke so thick it welled behind our eyes and so made of our weeping ashes. We arrived at nowhere with miles to go, no sleep before or after, just time passing through us, exhausted and bracing for impact. Thanks. Ryan, thank you. Thank you so much. There's always such an urgency and a musicality in your poems that I just really enjoy and just really appreciate you reading with us tonight. So thank you. I wanted to say also there's some free poems on very pretty paper <laughs> up on the table here if you want to grab one and take home. And they were made... Um, by Lisa and other members of the Iowa City Poetry Council um, to celebrate Poetry Month. Margaret LeMay. Oh, Margaret LeMay, thank you. So our third and final reader, Danica Kelly, I wanted to say that when I Googled Danica, <laughs> I came upon this poem in the Adroit Journal called Sighting Almost about hiking in Yosemite National Park. And I was just there last summer, and this poem like really struck me in my heart <laughs> because it really, you know, and when you're hiking in that park, you really, at every corner, you really feel your own mortality. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's signs that say, this is your last chance for water. <laughs> and there's signs about, you know, people that have gone missing. And there's just the gargantuanness and the, the granite. And so she wrote this poem and it just really struck me and I really, I'm not gonna give anything away, but <laughs> I really suggest you all look it up. It's really powerful. And I also wanted to say because, because poets are really bad at promoting themselves <laughs> that Danica won a very prestigious award recently <laughs> that isn't even, in, is, isn't even in her bio. It's the 2022 Annisfield Wolf Book Award in poetry, and she won this for her collection, The Renunciations. So congratulations, the big, you know, past winners were Natasha Trethewey, Toni Morrison, Lucille Clifton, so you know, no big deal. So, <laughs> so, so congratulations. Danica Kelly is the author of The Renunciations from Grey Wolf Press, 2021, and Bestiary, also from Grey Wolf. Bestiary is the winner of the Cave Canham Poetry Prize, a Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Poetry, and the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. The collection was also long listed for the National Book Award and was a finalist for a Publishing Triangle Award and a Lambda Literary Award. A Cave Canham graduate fellow and member of the Collective Poets at the End of the World, Danica has also received a Lannan Residency Fellowship and a Summer Workshop Fellowship from the Fine Arts Work Center. Her poems have been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic Online, The Paris Review, and Foglifter. She currently lives in Iowa City and is an assistant professor at the University of Iowa where she teaches creative writing. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. 
Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Jenny and Lisa. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, <laughs> hello, snaps for being here. That's right. Uh, <laughs> it's such a pleasure uh, to get to read in the library and to get to read with Genevieve and Ryan, um, to get to know the community, the poetry community in Iowa City a bit more. Uh, been in the house for the last two years. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to read some poems from uh, my book, The Renunciations. I'm going to start my timer because I can just wander and wander. You know, I, was, I wasn't sure what I was going to read. I was like, oh, I can read these like sad dad poems. Bad dad. I was like, no, I'm going to read about how I don't like to hike. Uh, <laughs> and so there are a bunch of poems in the book that have something to do with hiking and being outside. And I was just like, is that actually my vibe? Uh, I don't think it is. All right. Uh, so just know that those will be sprinkled throughout. Um, but the first poem I'm going to read, is that the first one I'm going to read? Okay, yeah, the first poem I'm going to read is titled Dear, D-E-A-R with an M dash. We come from abundance, each season bowed with rain, but here is the earth eager to flame, the air like salt, thirsty even for the water we carry in our skin. New wanderers in this land, we do not know how to wait for water, have never waited so long for rain that every tree died, left to stand tender. For now, I watch the shoulder burn, drive through the smoke that blots the mountains and holds the old yoke of sun. I know nothing of fire, its reach, know only that everybody makes its own ash, manages its own diminishing. Okay. <laughs> this is a hiking poem. Uh, the thing that I don't like about hiking there are many things that I don't like about hiking. But one of them is like you walk up a hill so that you can see something, usually. And I'm like, why couldn't I just like go to the thing that I'm trying to see from up? So in the case of Muir Woods National Monument, which is outside of San Francisco, uh, there's a hike that you can take and you can see just like a little triangle of the ocean. And I would much rather be at the beach. <laughs> I was like, why couldn't we just go to the beach? But that was not what we were doing. So um, this is titled Ours, Ours and Pathica. Muir Woods National Monument. We lived in the imperative. Walk through the tree, spin in the light, take dominion over one another. But about the tree, no euphemism there. A tree fell, a man with metal teeth ate the bark, the heartwood, the bark. We were like that then, eating and eating, sawing and sawn. I mean, of course, our bodies, but also how we mounted together the hill. Be dizzy set the sun, be dizzy, set the blood, be dizzy, set the heart and lungs and vessels between. How I cried at the summit, you blocked the sun and somewhere the ocean, with sweet anchor your eyes made. She could block the ocean because it was a little, <laughs> it was like a little tiny sliver of what, I'm just saying, I could have just gone to the beach. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, this is titled, In the Chapel of St. Mary's. I can't tell you what happened there, why I entered the sanctuary, a non-believer, only that I have been thinking about worship, the altar of the body, and supplication for some time. My thoughts turn, as they often do in the season of absence, to my wife and how tired a God can get when called, and too often, for little reason but loneliness, of course, I don't mean God here, but rather the woman I love who alters the orbit of my life, pulls me with the density of light toward her, the draw thinner when she is farther away as she is now. I try to find comfort in the inevitability of science when what I lack is faith. The sanctuary, the stained glass, four girls saturating it with soft chatter, small pots of stargazer lilies, a lace ribbon for each pew. This place is full of faith in the unknown, and I don't know how to believe in what I cannot see. Tonight, I will drive through the foothills and into the valley. I will try to make a little practice to trust you are with me, even though you are somewhere else. Skipping over the dad. Yes. <laughs> Forget that dude. Oh. <laughs> All right. Citing virtue. 
Rivergate Skate Center, Nashville, Tennessee. The man in orbit blooms a heart on his back. The heart blooms wings of water, and in me rises not mercy, but a sense of order. I've drifted, loosed from the one who bound me, a planet with no anchoring star, and I know this man is neither God nor sidereal body, but neither is he a woman with an alchemical heart. His skin, his beard, his full breast enrapture me, draw my gaze from every other whirling body. I've drifted, and I know the man in orbit is not a man in orbit, but one in revolution where revolution means change or a way of moving, where muscles ripple to water, where muscle ripples to water, moves from a state of gold to one of lead. Him. Dear river, dear creek, dear damned tributaries, dear fuse, dear dynamite and wet match, amen. The water don't love me and she don't love me and maybe I'm drowning from the inside. Who put the river in my arm said, don't let the water. Maybe the knife got a hard kiss and a sweet bite. Maybe the knife only metal and wood and a bit of brass, but maybe it know how to love the inside of me. Maybe I don't believe in meaning and God and plans and paths. And the closer I am to my animal self, the more human I am, the more I let myself break like a wave, ocean in my arm, stone in my arm, iron and wood and brass in my arm. So when Ryan was reading, he was like, oh, it's going to get us a little sad. And I was like, you have no idea, Ryan. <laughs> but actually, I think that might be the saddest it gets. So I'm fine. Everything's fine. Um, OK. So maybe y'all have had um, a devastating tarot reading. Has any of you had a devastating tarot reading? Oh, you're so lucky. Oh, so so. Right? Oh, a little, little. Dev oh, thank you. See, I know. I know there are people I hear about. Have you ever had a devastating tarot reading in a room full of your close friends? That's a special thing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a special experience. Um, citing tarot, Pflugerville, Texas. I learned how to hug here, how to draw a boundary and hold here against the gale force of my mother's late night rage and sob. Learned too what it meant to be chosen, to choose, Brought myself back to the receiving line. My chest cracked into two wet pieces after a fall so lonesome I wasn't sure I'd survive and met the arms practiced in mending. I asked Jenny to read my cards. Sid and Shannon on the couch behind me, Amber and Joe in the kitchen, Nat in from Berkeley, the kids running around, Carlisha, I'm sure, at my right hand. Jenny spread the Celtic cross, gestured as she does, which is to say grandly at the present, at the problems we all knew, the past, the conscious, the unconscious, waited for the cards to name what we could all see there at the position of hopes and fears, three swords and one heart. How rude, I thought. <laughs> Do y'all see this shit? I said aloud, the room gone quiet, a relief not to have to say what I had known in the room where I had learned the kind of love possible between friends, now family, the kindness possible between partners, grateful for the rough blow finally landed and the net to catch me. Dear, question. How do we process being overcome when we know the water is rising, rising because the sea ice is melting, melting because the animal we are shortens everything we touch into brief, useful pieces? Question. Can we call our marriage done, soon overcome, soon underwater, a city inhabited by whatever the sea brings to it? Question. How do you drown a city? Throw into the ocean every suffocation, the folded clothes, the lemon tree, a wife, anything that will sink as a stone. Dear one, it is, too, is it too soon to call? I cannot swim and I will not drown. Okay, and then more sad dad things, skip, skip, skip. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, I did not, I was not familiar with winter, is what I will say, uh, until I moved to Western New York. So I lived like I was born in L.A., lived for about 18 years in the South. There was a little winter experience in Nashville. Like, now I'm like, oh, that was cute. Um, but then I moved to Western New York, where it just snows and snows and snows. 
and then I lived in New York, in Brooklyn for a little bit, and then I moved here. So anyway, all of this is, is to say snow is new to me as a thing still. It's only been about five, six years where I'm like, snow? Okay. Dear, I take the first snowfall for ash. Mistake, I mean the first flake that comes wisping down for the remnant of something burned, perhaps for warmth or an error. When we were young, we stood with our backs not to the past or future, but toward the hot desperation of being alive and for right now. At the canyon's edge, the wind thick as a hand, ready to push you into gorge and river rock. Come back, I said, and the wind took my voice too. Love, there is no fire here, only water, finally drifting, to coat the grass, to keep it green, to heap the limbs and needle, needles in wet, heavy white. Like, do I want to read? Okay, where I end up, Western New York. So that's where I ended up. <laughs> Y'all, it was cold. Uh, but not, it was not, it was warmer than it is here. It was still quite cold. <laughs> I was like, this is, what did I do? Um, okay, choices. I'm making choices. Where I end up, Western New York. We push through high desert into a new wilderness, the air filling with water and timber and rich earth the farther east we went too far and older than anywhere I've ever lived and riven with loneliness. At night and alone, I imagine the ghosts this place carries pushing through the earth like water. I wonder whether the ones I carry will find a home here or if they will wander with me, faithful and true. What I bring, I've always had. A dull knife, a child afraid of the night and herself, the woman you left. Still, there's only doing and done, the same sun, and who can remember home? Okay, so this is citing almost. This is uh, my note here, because I would hate to forget this. If you've seen The Simpsons, or if you've seen Ted Lasso, these are two options. So my grandpa, one of my grandpa's dear friends, his name is Steve, and he is Ned Flanders slash Ted Lasso. <laughs> And that's a great person to hike with and also a terrible person to hike with. <laughs> it's just like, especially if you're really sad. Um, so this is Sighting Almost, Vernal Fall, Yosemite National Park. Never mind the 600 stairs carved in granite, or my guide, a man with a mustache and no concept of almost, or my moaned, why are we going up this hill at every hill, or his response that what comes up must go down, or the somewhere we've almost reached. Mind instead the three friends who breached the safety rail for a picture on the rocks and were swept over the falls by a river gorged with a melting snowpack. How they must have held each other in their descent before the Merced broke them apart. That was some time ago. An old man hiking with his son-in-law flatters me. You were only pretending to be tired to make us feel better. <laughs> the truth. I have come here to learn how not to kill myself. My guide takes my pictures many times as we ascend. He captures Half Dome, El Capitan, Nevada Fall, and me, nearly upright, a silhouette before the sun. This next one, so we go up to Vernal Fall, and then Steve says, oh, it's an easy hike down, because we'll take the John Muir Trail, and it's like very easy, and it's all downhill. But there had been a rock fall, <laughs> And so the whole trail was covered with boulders and like loose rocks. And these Californians, I said it was like California, these Californians, are like, they were like, whoa, the trail's pretty gnarly. And then we got on the trail and we were like, there is no trail, it's just rocks. <laughs> and that felt like a metaphor for something. Uh, citing Rock Fall, John Muir Trail, Yosemite National Park. Descent should be easy, but the granite molted like thunder and undid the trail, the root water and winter, then spring and water, the bloom, the cleaving. I picked over the rocks and broken boughs, the ground mulched soft. I carried her to the mouth of the trail when I meant to recover only myself. You see, I was the ghost, and she rose to sing, to be torn to pieces. A dead thing that in dying feeds the living. I've been thinking about the anatomy of the egg. 
about the two interior membranes, the yolk held in place by the calaisi, gases moving through the semi-permeable shell. Curious phrase, the anatomy of the egg, as if an egg were a body, which it is, as if the egg could be broken, then mended, which, depending on your faith, broken, yes, but mended, well, best to start again with a new body voided from a warmer one, brooded and turned, better to begin as if some small-handed animal hadn't knocked you against a rock, licked clean the rich yolk, and left the albumen to dry in the sun, as if a hinged jaw hadn't swallowed you whole. What I wanted, a practice that reassured that what was cracked could be mended or at least suspended so that it could not spread. But now I wonder, Better to be the egg or scaled mandible, the small hand or the flies, bottle black and green, spilling their bile, drinking it, spilling their bile into whatever's left, sweeping the interior, drinking it clean. I think something might have grown there, though I know it was never meant to be eaten. It was always meant to spoil. The last poem. Thank you for your, your good attention and laughing at my jokes. I appreciate that. Um, the last poem is The Moon Rose Over the Bay. I had a lot of feelings. There's no moon in this poem and there's no bay. So just like, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just like vibes, like it's just vibes, okay? All right, so The Moon Rose Over the Bay, I had a lot of feelings. The home I've been making inside myself started with a raising, a brush clearing, the thorn and nettle, the blackberry bush falling under the bush hog. Then I rested. A cycle fallow said winter, said the ground is too cold to break pony, said I almost set fire to it all, lit a match, watched it ghost in the wind. Came the thaw, came the melting snowpack, the flooded river, new ground water, the well risen. I stood in the mud field and called it a pasture, stood with a needle in my mouth and called it a song. Everything rushed past my small ears, were in the leaves, were in the wing and the wood, about time to get a hammer, I thought. About time to get a nail and saw. Thank y'all, thank you. Yeah, I'd invite um, the poets to come up and sit at this lovely long table <laughs> for our <laughs> Q&A. Thank you so much, Danica. I love your hiking poems. <laughs> I, you're right, that descent, it's not easy at all. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> um, so yeah, please, um, if you have a question for any of the poets, um, Lisa can bring her trusty mic to you <laughs> and we can, we can go ahead and do that. Okay. Actually, I have a question. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you guys, you're writers, you're teachers, you work all day. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do to fill the well, <laughs> so to speak? Like, what do you do, you know, what are your hobbies? Like, what do you, what do, you do to kind of, you know, kind of get that juice to, to write and to create? <laughs> um, wow. So I often get juice, I guess, from my children. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they're they're an infinite well of mm -hmm. um, of inspiration. Um, I mean, I don't know that my hobbies help much. I, I do a lot of board gaming. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever written written a poem about uh, Yggdrasil or <laughs> any of the other games. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have no valuable answer to this question. <laughs> I, I don't know that I do either. Uh, I'm a musician first. Like I've been playing drums since I was like three years old, like my first snare drum when I was three. So like music has been a thing, especially, which has been nice when writing hasn't been happening. But like just tra traveling around like and hearing these poems, like mm -hmm. and hearing Danica read, like I, I went out west last summer for just a couple weeks, but I drove like 5,500 miles in 13 mm. days. Wow. Um, and I've got, all the, I've got all these notes and voice notes and like things that might be poems someday or something. And I've not really gone back to them, so. But like traveling tends to be pretty generative. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I don't really have any hobbies. It's like really embarrassing. I have like no hobbies. Um, <laughs> it's like I have ideas for hobbies, but the pandemic has really mm. put a damper on that. But similarly, I don't know that I like have a bowling poem in me. <laughs> like I don't know that that's, that's a thing. Um, but who knows? Maybe, maybe. Uh, but I, I think I just like try to be present when I can where I am. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, looking out the window. It's very important. Um, and some of that's thinking time. Some of that's, you know, just like actually making some observations. Uh, and just following my interests. Like I'm interested in whales. So I'm thinking about whales right now. Um, doing some standing on the beach with binoculars and looking at the water and hoping to see a whale. But there sometimes is no whale. But it's nice to stand on the beach. <laughs> so occasions to go to the beach. Um, yeah, uh, you know, going to therapy. <laughs> it's a big one. It's like I keep unearthing things. There's just a lot in there. So, um, yeah. We have a question over here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, one thing I noticed in everybody's work that I heard was like this balance between softness and also like, um, like harshness, like, like the the truth, the harsh truth, but also like the soft imagery, or like um, there's like a gentleness and there's also like a rage there. And I just like want to know how you balance that. I find that in my own work, like it's either like too like incoherently angry, or like you know, like or like um or like like too soft, or you know, how mm -hmm. do you get to that like balance? Um, but yeah. Do you want to start, Ryan? Why don't you start, Ryan? Okay, sure. Um, I, 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 I try not to be incoherently angry any more than I am, like, off the page. Um, so I guess, like, the page is, like, a place where um, I try to sort maybe some of that out in a little bit more musical kind of way, mm -hmm. um, a little more thoughtful way. Um, I, I, it's kind of just, like, I, I just try to, like, lean into the, the music of the language a little bit and kind of, like, I follow that more than I follow whatever the sort of, like, um, kind of triggering impulses, I guess, you know, and I'll just, you know, kind of one word after another. Um, and that music tends to, like, soften out some edges and kind of, like, open mm -hmm. up some um, some meaning possibilities. I'm, like, less concerned with, like, meaning, too, I guess. Like, I like sort of things that are, like, maybe a little more opaque or, like, hard to parse um, and just have a feel, have a vibe. Um, and so if I can get somewhere close to that, then I feel like maybe I'm doing something well. But it's I usually just kind of go by my ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great way of putting it. I, I following the language is is the the whole of it. It's um, it, it's the 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 shape of the tones and the shape of the words um, and the way they fill the spaces that are left after the anger. Mm -hmm. I guess um, I used to get really upset at that quote. Is it? Is it Wordsworth that said that, that uh, poetry is uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. motion recollected in tranquility? And I used to get so pissed off at that. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm writing right now, and I'm angry right now, and this is what's important. But, <laughs> but it's still like, even as you're doing it, it's, it's the, the reflection. Mm -hmm. It's not, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's, that's like well said. Um, the, like, I'm a fan of, like, writing in the moment of having the feeling, but then also writing in the moment of not having the feeling or revising in the moment of not having the feeling. Uh, the artifice of poetry is very helpful. Mm -hmm. It's like, does it sound good? What are the lines mm -hmm. doing? Like, what is this music that I can, like, sort of draw up? And then that becomes a, a different concern for the poem. But the biggest thing that I've done that's helped me deal with topics that are difficult uh, is therapy. Um, <laughs> and being able to say things in therapy so that the first time that I'm saying it is not necessarily when I'm writing, but that I'm coming mm -hmm. to the page or like two poems with a question about like, why am I telling myself this story? Why does this story stay with me in this way? And coming with curiosity and tenderness instead of like wanting to shove it down. <laughs> And I think, like, being curious has been one of the, the biggest... It's, like, opened up a lot for me, like, being curious in, instead of, like, oh, I don't want to feel this feeling or... So, I, I, yeah, so I think there are, there are lots of ways to, to think about that. But if you're thinking of the question of, like, how can I balance this, I think you're on the way, you know. Yeah. yeah. 
I once heard the worst part about writing is writing. And um, <laughs> so I guess I wanted to ask, uh, what's your least favorite uh, part about writing poetry? Mm. <laughs> um, the, oh. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, all of it. Like, oh. <laughs> like writing is torture. It's um, I I find my greatest joy in life in editing, but I don't edit myself, and I very seldom mm -hmm. go back to my work and revise. I'm a terrible reviser, but because I'm always sort of editing as I go, mm. so everything is just sort of like turned in my head like 10 times and by the time it gets onto the page, it's like, oh, finally. Um, but also there's, there's the ending bits, right? It's, um, I, I, there's always the question of how do you know when a poem is finished and you don't because it's, it's like, it's like your child moving out of the house when when they turn eighteen. Like you're you're not done raising them, but they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, I, yeah, uh, I was gonna say like not like I I really like writing. I kind of miss writing more mm -hmm. than I have been in a while. I'm kind of getting mm -hmm. to that point where I'm like trying not to let it get in my head, but like. Um, and like you know, I, I just just the the working out of things and just like sort of playing around with language has always been really fun, even if it like ends up not going in. Like I'm the same way. Like if I can't get a rough draft in one sitting, then I'm like sort of happy with. I'm probably never going back to that. Mm -hmm. That's probably a dead page in a notebook or a mm -hmm. word document that's going to get buried in my you know external hard drive. The, but the other thing, like just thinking about like trying to like put work out in the world, which is the thing that I've mm -hmm. done, like. All of that has been, I don't know, feels like more and more unhealthy for me mm -hmm. lately. And just mm -hmm. so I'm just trying to think about just writing and like not maybe trying to do anything with it and just trying to have that space for myself mm -hmm. on the page with whatever comes mm -hmm. and then, you know, worry about that other stuff because sometimes that stuff is, um, I mean, it's a totally different work, mm -hmm. I think, too. But like also just having that in kind of the back of your mind that like, oh, where, where am I, what am, what am I going to do with this thing? Mm -hmm. And like that voice, I'm really trying to like kind of quiet a little bit and just like nothing it doesn't matter what you do with it. And what matters is that you do it. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. I had a student once, I gave a, an exercise, but it was kind of like off the books. Like I had, I just struck it from the syllabus and they were like, give us the exercise anyway. And I was like, okay. And I gave them the exercise. And then one of them was like, well, what are we supposed to do with it? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> like, what do right. you do with a poem? It's not really clear. Um, you put it in a folder. Yeah. I think that's what you do. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> and then you just put it in a folder. It'll be fine. Uh, I love writing. I love it. It, it orders my life. It is a space for me to center what I'm thinking and feeling and to work through the big questions that um, matter to me. Like, how do I want to relate to people? How do I want to think about my family? How do I want to be as a citizen in the world? Um, but also, it's just fun. Like, it's fun. So what I, what I don't like is uh, when I get too busy, and that's usually my own fault, but sometimes it's like just having a job. Uh, when I can't write, it's like I feel a little itchy now, and I'm like ready to do it. But I love it, and I'm just like when I sit down, I'm just like, oh, this is so good. It doesn't even matter if it's good or not. I'm just like, oh, this is so good. Um, oh yeah, torture. Oh yeah, that's intense. <laughs> I think it's says pleasure. I wouldn't do it if it weren't pleasurable. Very that. Yeah, that's 100. percent Yeah, it's like there are other things one could do. Um, no need to torture oneself. I don't well, think. it's really lovely having written, though. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I think we're going to wrap up this evening. This has just been utterly delightful. <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing your words with us. And thank you to our participants in the, in the room here for coming out and listening and supporting Iowa City Poetry. And we adore you all. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.